be remarkable. You don't have to be Jane Goodall or Elon Musk or Steve Jobs. You're just making a difference to one person, yourself. What happened in 1983? How did you get a job at Apple? Why did you say yes? Steve wanted to make people more creative and productive. This was an Apple was on the ropes. The most valuable things you learned from Steve Jobs was the willingness to change your mind. When CEOs make apologies, they never utter the <clears throat> most important two words. I'm sorry. In the current state of the world, it's not enough to think different. You need to think remarkable. Guy, it is awesome to have you here on the Learning Leader Show. Welcome. Oh, thank you very much for having me. So I want to go back earlier in your career. Let's go to 1977. You enrolled at UCLA's Anderson School of Management. You earned an MBA. And while you were there, you got a job working at a jewelry company, Nova Stylings, I believe it was called. Yes. And you said <laughs> the jewelry business is very, very tough. Tough business. Tougher than the computer business. But you said you learned a valuable lesson during for when you were working in that job, and that is how to sell. Can you yes. go back to that time and talk about sure. the how valuable it was to learn to sell early in your career? Yeah. So I think many people, when they hear the word sell today, they only think e-commerce. And when they think about optimizing e-commerce, it's all about, well, Let's do this A B test on our landing page. And, you know, does the blue text work better than the yellow text and the purple text? And if we place this graphic or whatever, do we get 1% more click throughs? But the jewelry business, this is back in the 70s, as you say, it's a hand to hand combat business. So I work for a jewelry manufacturer who sold to retailers. So we didn't sell to the actual end user. We sold to the retailer, the Tiffany's and the Cartier's of the year of the world. And let's just say that when you're Tiffany Cartier or many fine jewelers, the, the power is on your side because you're the buyer and we're the seller. And arguably, we need you more than you need me because there's a lot of people manufacturing jewelry and there's only one Tiffany or Cartier. So you learn hand-to-hand -hand combat. You learn patience because there's many times you're sitting in the outside the buyer's office, you know, for hours because I don't know, because they're running late or because they just want to show you who's boss. And jewelry is made out of expensive components, but they are nonetheless just raw materials. So often you meet these buyers and they, they look at your ring, for example, and they just they want to just stick it on a scale and they'll tell you, OK, so there's such and such grams of gold. The spot price of gold is X today. You have 18 karat gold, so it's 18 24 times the spot price. That's how much your ring is worth. And because I'm a nice person, I'm going to give you like 10% more for quality and design and, you know, all that. And by the way, I want to place a large order. I want it delivered in 60 days and I will pay you 90 days after I receive the shipment. <laughs> And meanwhile, you know, when you're buying gold and diamonds, it's not like you get 180 day terms, right? And so uh, it's a brutal business. It's not like working for Google doing A-B testing. And uh, I, I have come to the conclusion that when all is said and done, there are two primary functions in business. You're either making it or you're selling it. And everything else is kind of secondary. And so that was a very valuable lesson. And I th it's a lesson I like to pass on to people that, you know, if your lips are moving, you're probably selling. It may be selling your parents on letting you do something or maybe selling yourself for a job interview. It, it could be that you're in the check-in counter of United Airlines and you're trying to convince somebody why you should be upgraded. Uh, but you are selling. It's so true. Dan Pink popularized this even more with to sell his human that it feels like no matter what your job is, yeah, you're in sales, you're in sales. And so it's worth it to get good at that. So in a way, 
I'd have to imagine it was a huge blessing for you to have a sales job, a brutal sales job early in your career to set yourself up for the rest of your career in sales, whether you had a quota or it was considered a sales job or not. Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, I, I wouldn't even say it was a mixed blessing. It was a pure blessing. Yeah. Because <laughs> Yeah, I think as you and this extrapolates to more than sales training, but I think as you look back, it's the toughest teacher, the toughest coach, the toughest boss, the tough, toughest podcasting host. They're the ones who help you learn and improve your game. It's not the boss or the teacher that lets you get what get away with murder. But having said that, you know, it can take 20 years to figure that out. Mm-hmm. Hey everyone, I am Ryan Hawk, host of The Learning Leader Show and owner of this YouTube channel. I just learned a fascinating stat, and that is 95% of people who view our videos are not yet subscribed. And so, if you'd like to ensure you're seeing all of the amazing interviews we're going to do, and we have some good ones coming up, then smash that subscribe button. I know everyone says that, but it's critical to ensure you're seeing what we have coming up. So I thank you for viewing, and I look forward to you being a part of this learning leader journey moving forward. Thank you so much. Yeah, but you, you progress on, and we're going to fast forward a little bit to 1983. Okay, now looking back, it's like, Wow, getting a job at Apple, of course, that would be the coolest thing ever. But 1983, those were different days. What happened in 1983? How did you get a job at Apple? Why did you say yes? Uh, take, take me back to that time. Well, it started with falling in love with computers. Yeah. So um, I bet most of your audience can't even understand some of the terms I'm going to use. But back then, if you were in college and you had to turn in term papers, you had to type them. And so you either typed it yourself and you used, you know, erasable paper or the Selectric typewriter, which lifted off the mistakes, or you used whiteout, or if you just surrendered, you found a typist who would type the term paper for you. So that's the state of the art. And, you know, you, you're trying to make it like you can't make it triple space, but maybe you can get double space because you're trying to meet the minimum for the paper length and, you know, all that. And then putting in footnotes and yeah, I mean, it's a pain in the ass to, to do all these things. That's so easy now in word. And so you coming from that world and then someone shows you an Apple II with a word processor where you can just backspace over <laughs> errors and, you know, you get it to where you want it and you press print and it spits off and that's like total magic. And it's, it's hard to explain that to someone who grew up with who didn't grow up with typewriters. So now, so now you're in the Apple II world and you have this sort of 24 by 80 monospace font and it's magic. You press print. And then somebody shows you Mac Right. And Mac Right has multiple fonts, integration of fonts and graphics. You can change size. You can make them bold and outline and shadow and underline. And it's another magical moment. I'm not like getting all nostalgic just thinking about it. <laughs> and so uh, I had fallen in love with the Apple II and personal computing. And my friend who I went to school with at Stanford hired me. Now, you have to understand that, you know, I mean, by all modern recruiting practices, you look for a person with the relevant educational background and relevant work experience. And I will tell you, I had neither because I majored in psychology at school because that's the easiest major I could find. And I had attended law school for two weeks and quit, which, you know, uh, Honestly, I quit an irrelevant program for tech, but still I quit something after two weeks. And I had this easy major and I quit law school. And I was coming from the jewelry business where I was counting gold and diamonds. So, you know, if if you're, well, thank God. I mean, if there were these resume reviewing systems today, it would it would have just spit me out because like irrelevant education, irrelevant work experience, 
like, did he apply to this job by mistake? Um, so I got hired because of this Stanford roommate, and it was 100% nepotism. It was favoritism. It was a personal relationship. A and I, I learned a valuable lesson that I want to pass on to people, which is it doesn't matter how you got your job. What matters is what you do once you get your job. So it could be nepotism. You could be the boss's daughter, the founder's son, whatever it is. What matters next is what you do with the position, not how you got in. So true. And obviously you made some waves because it went well for you in your career. How did you take this good fortune, uh, this good friendship, and then make the most of the opportunity? It happens that. I, I'm a grinder. I love to work and I love to work and I loved the technology. And that's a hard combination to beat. I mean, you could, you know, you could love Mercedes Benz, but hate selling. So you will never be a good Mercedes Benz salesperson. But if you love Mercedes and you love selling, you know, you're going to be Joe Girard. You're going to be the most successful car salesman in the world. And I loved computing and I loved evangelizing. So my first job was a software evangelist. Evangelism comes from the Greek word, meaning bringing the good news. So evangelism, I think, is the purest form of sales because it's not just your quota, your bonus, your salary. Evangelism means you have good news and you're looking out for the best interest of the other person. So when I was evangelizing Macintosh to developers, I really did believe that, you know, listen, Macintosh is good for you. It has a much richer development environment. It's tapping a new market of people who would never buy computers. And it's avoiding your dependence or over-dependence on IBM. So for these three good reasons, becoming a Macintosh developer is good for you. And it's also good for me. And that was my basis uh, for evangelism, really, for the rest of my career. I read that uh, one of the most valuable things you learned from Steve Jobs was the importance of and the willingness to change your mind to change what you're doing to reverse yourself at an extreme you said that's a a high sign of intelligence why is it important for leaders to be willing to change their mind <laughs> well at at the most basic level it's because leaders are not always right mm. and i could even say maybe they're seldom right <laughs> and so uh, you know a good leader this this comes to the concept that I explain in the book of what's called <laughs> a mission-driven asshole. So there are many kinds of assholes, but the most common form of asshole is the egocentric asshole. It's, you know, I'm the CEO. It's all about me. I have my personal assistant. My personal assistant has a personal assistant. I have a driver. I have security. I have my PR flax. You know, this glorification is all about me. And that was not Steve at all. So the mission-driven asshole is driven by the mission of bringing good news. Steve wanted to make people more creative and productive. So I can tell you, it wasn't about him. It was about making people more creative and productive. And that kind of asshole is, it can be actually quite gratifying to work for because you see that this person is not out for himself. He's out for this cause that let's make people more creative and productive. Let's bring this great computer to market. And so when you're a mission-driven asshole, it's about the mission. So if you're wrong, it's not a big deal to reverse yourself because it's good for the mission. It might not be good for your personal prestige and ego, but it's good for the mission. So mission-driven asshole is, no, I, I mean, I, a preference is you don't have to be an asshole, but it's better to have a mission-driven asshole than an ego-driven nice person. An ego-driven nice person. So like, did you work for some of those? 
can't say that I have. I've been fortunate. <laughs> really? Well, I can, like, I can, I'll give you an example of, okay. a, of a mission-driven nice person. Okay. It's Melanie Perkins of Canva. Yeah, I thought you might say she that. She is a true class act. And uh, she's like Steve Jobs with a heart and soul. <laughs> <laughs> Steve didn't have a heart and soul? <laughs> well, let's just say that it was hard to detect sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but just mission focused, laser focused on that and didn't care about hurting feelings or having a heart or anything yeah. else. Whereas Melanie and Canva, I love Canva. I've used it for a while. I know it's one of my f wife's all time favorite tools. We're subscribers. We we're paying customers of it. So uh, you're, 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 you know, you're like chief evangelist. You've been with them. I feel like for a while now, but yeah. yeah. Tell me more about Melanie and what it's like working with her. Well, I mean, when I first Melan met Melanie, this is when she was starting this business for printing yearbooks, and it was out of her mom's spare bedroom in Western Australia, I think Perth. I've never been to Perth, so I can't tell you firsthand. And you know, I listen, I have known a lot of CEOs, I've known a lot of companies, and I don't know one company that is even close to the Toyota saying of the relentless pursuit of perfection. Now, there are companies that are completely engineering driven. There are companies that are completely operational driven. There's companies that are completely sales driven. And, and when you see these companies, they're like really good at engineering, but everything else is kind of second class citizens. I'm telling you, from top to bottom, when you meet people from Canva, they could be just working on the onboarding process. They could be in customer service. They could be in, you know, helping people set up their profiles and their billing cards and, you know, whatever. But everybody is trying to perfect what they do. It, you know, there's people who they're in the, in the position of, we have to have a good, diverse collection of templates for any given design type, right? So a design type is like Instagram, 16 by nine presentation, resume, infographics, you know, landing page for Etsy, whatever. And there are people who are in charge and create the templates. And they are so into creating great templates and that's why, you know, you can be productive in Canva faster than you can install Photoshop. It's because those people are trying to make the best collection of templates. So, you know, if if you've thought about it, there probably is already a template for it. So if you're running an Etsy store and you say, well, Etsy store has a standard store background. I need to create a good one. If you go to Canva, you type in Etsy. I guarantee you, you'll find a background maker. <laughs> I can see why they hired you. What's how did they? How did that come about? Your relationship with the company, and what's your current state in relationship okay, and so, working? Uh, like, what do you day to day with the company? Okay, so you know this is. This is what I call guys golden touch. Now, <laughs> many people would assume guys golden touch means guy, whatever he touches turns to gold. Let me tell you something. I wish that was true. So guys golden touch is whatever's gold guy touches. <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is that Canva and the key to great evangelists and evangelism is you evangelize something great because it is so easy to evangelize something great and it is so hard to evangelize crap. So I've been fortunate at the beginning of my career, I evangelized Macintosh at the end of my career, I'm evangelizing Canva. And, you know, so I was fat, dumb and happy. I was using Twitter 10, 11 years ago and I had someone working with me named Peg Fitzpatrick. And she was making most of my tweets. And we had this theory that every tweet should come with either a video or a picture. So she was using Canva to make the pictures for my tweets. And one day, Cliff Obrick, the co-founder, noticed that I was using Canva to make tweets. So he, he reached out to me 
And he said, you know, hey, you know, we're from Canva and and we noticed that you're using Canva to make your tweets. Um, we're really thankful that you're using our product. And, you know, we're going to be in the United States. Maybe there's some time we can get together. And it just, I happened to see that at mention. I happened to respond. I happened that they're, it happened that they're coming to the United States. And, and. It just all worked out. And then like two weeks later, they're at my house in, in Silicon Valley and they give me this demo. And I, and I say to Peg, you know, Peg, isn't Canva the thing you use? She says, yes. I say, well, is it any good? She goes, yeah, it's really good. I said, sure, I help them. She says, yes. So I can tell you honestly, if Peg Fitzpatrick had not told me all those things, I would not have helped Canva. And if I would not have helped Canva, I might not be on your podcast right now. So, <laughs> mm. um, so it was pure, like, you know, in a sense, dumb shit luck that they found me. And it was pure dumb shit luck that I responded positively. And the rest is history. But you know what you were doing? You were taking action. You were sharing your thoughts. You were publishing your writing. Yes, you had somebody helping you that happened to be using their tool. But if oh, you said, yeah. you know, I, I, I don't want to publish my, my thoughts uh, publicly or online for all to read. I'd rather keep that to myself. Yeah. I'd rather just go about my life. If you went that route, that, <laughs> then also none of this happens. And I think this is a good lesson, Guy, that leaders, it is useful. Not only does it help make the world better and it help other people by publishing your beliefs and your thoughts because you're, you're, you're teaching in a sense, but it also creates more opportunities, opportunities for serendipity and luck. Oh, and God. anything that can do that for us, why wouldn't we do that? In addition to helping people along the way, it seems like a, tr a true win-win. Right. And it's, it's, it's a true win-win. And you know it doesn't cost anything really. It just has to. It has to take a, an open mind, a growth mindset. And as Steve Jobs says, you can only connect the dots looking backwards. So can I tell you the ultimate story of connecting dots and serendipity and all that stuff? Okay, so we got to go back way, way back in time, over fifty years ago. And I'm a young punk in a lower middle class part of Honolulu. I'm in a public school. My sixth grade teacher tells my parents that I have too much potential. You should take me out of the public school system, put me in a private school system, make me go to college. Thank you, God. My parents listened to her. Thank you, God, that my parents made the sacrifice to do that. So I get into this private school. I really, I don't remember why, but somehow somebody convinced me to apply to Stanford and I applied to Stanford. This is so long ago. Back then, Japanese Americans were considered an oppressed minority. They had to be helped. They needed special treatment. That's a little reverse today. But anyway, <laughs> so because I'm Japanese American and by the grace of God, I get into Stanford and then I meet this guy who eventually hired me into Apple, Mike Boych, right? So there's serendipity. Of course, I was properly prepared to be an evangelist because of the jewelry business of all things. <laughs> so now I'm working at Apple and I'm successful. I'm, I'm pretty visible as a software evangelist, blah, blah, blah. 10 years later, I get this email out of the blue from the executive director of the TEDx Palo Alto conference. And she says, I'm a Macintosh user. You don't know who I am, but I know who you are because I use a Macintosh. And Jane Goodall has an accepted, has accepted an invitation to speak at TEDx Palo Alto. And I need someone to interview her on stage. Are you interested? And my reaction is, holy shit. I mean, does the sun rise? Of course I'm interested. <laughs> so I interview Jane Goodall and we become fast friends. And then a few more years go by and I decided to do a podcast. And I'm thinking like, you know, to, to do a podcast, you, you got to make a like splash, right? You got to like show people that you've arrived, that you're not just Guy Kawasaki interviewing somebody you never heard of about something you never heard of. So I think, ah, well, who would be perfect? Jane Goodall. And to my utter amazement, she says, yes. So my first guest on my podcast is Jane Goodall. And and let me say that, you know, it's 
once you get Jane Goodall as your first guest, the second guest is pretty easy, right? Because <laughs> I, I don't know about you, but when when somebody asks me to be on a podcast, if I'm not in a book introductory phase where I say yes to everybody, but generally speaking, when somebody asks me to be a guest, the first question I ask is, well, who else have you had? Because I want to see, you know, did you have Daniel Pink? Did you have Bob Cialdini, Angela Duckworth, Stephen Wolfram, Steve Wozniak, Margaret Atwood, Stacey Avram, Vivek Murthy? You know, who have you had? And so from beginning from episode two, when people say, well, who else have you had? I said, well, I don't know. I've had Jane Goodall, for example. Maybe you've heard of her. And, you know, nobody ever says, oh, you know, you have mediocre second tier guests. I'm not going to come on your podcast after they hear I had Jane. (laughs) So the point of this whole long story is that from the sixth grade teacher to Jane Goodall on my podcast, I can trace the dots. And a lot of it is serendipitous that. I did a lot. I, I not only was a software evangelist convincing developers, I just started helping people at random with Macintosh. I did whatever it took, not just not just developers, but you know, anybody. And so that's why the TEDx person heard of me, which is why she invited me to interview Jane Goodall, which is how I became her friend, which is why she is on my podcast. Now This is a long story. I'm starting to bore people. But now fast forward to 2023. And I asked Jane Goodall, can you write the forward for my book, Think Remarkable? And she says, yes. So basically, I'm telling you, I got Jane Goodall on my podcast and to write the forward for my book because of a sixth grade teacher at Kalihi Valley Elementary School in Honolulu, Hawaii in about 1967. (laughs) Guy, that is a lot of cool dots. I'll tell you, man, (laughs) a lot of cool dots. But I'd have to imagine, and you go back and look at a lot of people's dots in their lives, that if you went to the private school and decided not to apply yourself and not to try and not to up your game, you probably don't go to Stanford. And then all the other dots are different as well. And so, yes, Got to be grateful for these teachers and these people who lift us up. But then once you get the opportunity, just like you said with the job, once you get the opportunity, if you don't get most of it, that dot and the future dots go away. So it's on all of us to make the most of the lucky situations we get to then create the next cool dot. Yeah. And and you know what? I, I Like people disagree with this theory of mine, but my theory is – you default to yes. You know, when people ask you to do something, and I I, I interviewed Andrew Zimmern, the Bizarre Foods guy, mm-hmm. and one of the points he made that stuck with me and made it into the book is that, you know what, when you're young, you make yourself indispensable, right? You do the shit work. You do the work nobody else wants to do. If when he was working for the TV station, if if the TV station management kids said, well, we got to lay some cable, you know, yes, I'll go. We got to set up some lights for this interview. Yes, I'll go. We got to figure out how to edit video. Yes, I'll do that. And so you make yourself indispensable. And then, I don't know, I don't know if it's just karmic scoreboard or it's justice, but somehow it all returns to you. You just have to believe that. And if you mm-hmm. don't, and, you know, be a tight ass and focus on only the things that you can see the immediate short term return and you're going to end up frustrated. I mean, if we, if we have a daily focus on how we can help other people, how we can make their lives better, easier, help them excel. And that is just the constant drumbeat of how we show up in the world each day. It's yeah. weird how things seem to work out, isn't it? Yeah, it 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 really is. And um, it's, I, I seriously think there's a karmic scoreboard out there and yeah. listen, you know, the, the, when you say yes, you know, sign me up, it leads to other opportunities and other conversations. Whereas no is a shut door. It is a slamming door. It is the end of a discussion, right? So if you say yes, maybe 
a few days down the line, you have to change your mind because you just cannot do something. But it takes a few days or a few weeks to figure that out. And in that time, maybe you figure out that, oh, I said yes, and I really can do this, and I really want to. So um, it's not that I never say no, but I say yes more than most people. Uh, especially, you know, there's a whole class of quote unquote influencers, and, you know, they're not going to mention your product unless, you know, there's some commission or some kickback or something like that. And I'm at this stage in my life. I just help people for the sheer pleasure of helping people. And it comes back. Speaking of helping people, um, you, you wrote in your acknowledgments of your book, or you call them mahalo. Uh, I can make the case that acknowledgments or mahalo in this case, it should be the first thing you read in a book. I'll tell you, guy, it is the first thing I read in books because I'm most curious about the people behind yeah. what it, what, how it, how this book got made. And I wanted to ask about w one of those people for for you. Um, I, I'll probably pronounce her last name wrong, but Lisa Leopold. Yeah. Um, you said I've written 16 books. Thousands of people have read drafts. Hundreds have offered me feedback. Lisa is the best tester. I have ever encountered her eye for detail and her logical thinking are remarkable. And she is an expert in the art of apologizing. Can you tell me more about Lisa and what she's yeah. meant to you? So uh, uh, there's a publication that I highly recommend to people. It's called the conversation and the conversation only publishes articles by academics. So everybody has to have an academic standard and a standing and, you know, they could write about, election fraud or they could write about how to apologize but it's not just because you're making shit up it's because you're a professor of political science or something so she wrote this she wrote this great article about apologizing and i was so taken with that article i reached out to her and i said i want to put you on my podcast so we became friends and um i just noticed that she had an extremely analytical mind and she would point out logical fallacies to me and stuff like that. So I started sending her my drafts and she, she I, I've never met anybody who had a more organized and logical mind. And I pride myself in having an organized and logical mind. And she was just smoking me. And so we became friends and she, she's a big part of the quality of this book because she would see stuff like, you know, on page 25, guy, you said this. And on page 35, you contradicted yourself. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, she's and, and, you know, so that's her logical mind. And then her art of apology or apologizing is really I've never heard anybody so eloquently explain how to apologize and there's a section in my book where I have an example from a politician and Mark Zuckerberg, where she dissects their apologies. And let's just say it's not pretty. <laughs> Can you go deeper into that section? Well, you know, remember when Mark Zuckerberg was a, apologized for the, the fact that Cambridge Associates got all this data during the mm -hmm. election? Mm -hmm. And what happens when CEOs make apologies is they, they never utter the <clears throat> most important two words. And those two words are, I'm sorry, right? It's always some kind of hedging, like, I didn't intend for our company to leak your confidential data. I'm sorry if it had negative. No, they don't say I'm sorry. I'm saying we regret that it may have had negative consequences for you. You know, we're always concerned about confidentiality and this just happened by mistake. And like, it's blah, 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 blah. Why don't you just freaking say, I'm sorry, it should not have happened, right? And people don't do that. So she gave me a whole list of how to op optimize your apologies. And I think that, you know, going back to the mission driven asshole, a mission driven asshole who can say, I'm sorry, is very hard to beat. I'll give you one more clause. If you're a mission driven asshole who can say, I'm sorry, 
and then three more magical words, which I swear never crosses the lips of most CEOs. And those three words are, I don't know. You show me a CEO who could say publicly, I don't know. And I'll show you a good CEO. Mm. I don't know is impactful and important, but I had a CEO tell me once that it's okay not to know, but you also should follow up with, but I'm willing to work to figure it out. Yes. What about, what about that follow-up part of it? Absolutely. Yes. So, yeah. you know, especially if you're a young person, if somebody says to you, well, um, uh, you know, wh what's the best way to shoot vertical video for TikTok? And I want to <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Right. And let's say that you really, you don't know. You should say, I don't know, but I will figure it out. You should never, ever say to your boss, I don't know and stop. Yeah. It should always be, I don't know, but I'll find out because I pretty much, and this is even before AI, every question that anybody has won, wondered about is probably answered on YouTube. Now, I'm not saying if your boss says, you know, guy, does God exist? I'm, obviously, it's not that kind of question. But any question about, you know, how do I create a table of contents in Microsoft Word? You know, somebody has asked that question. There's something on Reddit or there's something on the Word help system, but there's a YouTube video. There's probably 20 YouTube videos for that. And so if you're a young person in particular, you should never, ever, ever say to your boss, I don't know without saying, I don't know yet. Mm, but I'll get yes. the answer for you. <clears throat> uh, another person you write about um, in your book is called uh, Halim, I believe, Flowers, an activist yes. and artist. Age 16, he served 22 years in prison for a murder he did not commit, nor aid or abet. And while in prison, he became an artist, a scholar, and an author. Can you tell me more about how Halim Flowers has impacted your life? Well, Halim Flowers... You, well, you heard his background, and he, if you're familiar with art, and trust me when I tell you, when I first met him, I didn't know who this person was, <laughs> okay? So I don't want to give this impression that I'm this art connoisseur, and I know what the hell I'm talking about. But Halim Flowers may be destined to be the next Jean-Michel Basquat, and so for Many of you will already know that name, but others don't. Just, just Google Jean-Michel Basquat, B-A-S-Q-U-A-T, I think. I-A-T, yeah, you got it. He was in that Andy Warhol generation. And so, yes, he came out of prison after 22 years, and he had become an extensive reader in prison, and he kind of... You know, you, I, listen, I've never been in prison, but he came out with this attitude like, you know, if I'm angry at the, at the world and society, I, he probably has the right to be angry, but what, what's that going to do? You know, how is that going to make his life better? So anyway, he took up art and speaking and writing in order to make himself a better person and his art is truly remarkable so i found out about him and then i interviewed him and there's a great story about john michel basquat that he sold what may be the most expensive painting an american artist ever sold for 110 million dollars okay 110 million dollars it's called the mask and just by coincidence, it was sold to a wealthy Japanese industrialist. So I said to, I said to Halim in the interview, hey, Halim, you know, if you're the next Jean-Michel Basquad, how about you make me a painting? But I cannot afford $110 million. But you can tell people I'm a wealthy Japanese industrialist too. And you know, we can make up a story. So I swear to God, the next day he painted that painting for me and it was it was dedicated to my book, Think Remarkable. I have it in my house. I also have a picture of it 
two pictures of it really in the book. And so I, I think he's a good example the, of, you know, to be remarkable, you don't have to be Jane Goodall or Elon Musk or Steve Jobs. Sometimes being remarkable, you're just making a difference to one person, yourself. You're turning your own life around. And I have great respect for people who overcome something like 22 years of imprisonment to become remarkable, right? I mean, if you're like the son or daughter of a of a private equity or or Goldman Sachs partner or something, yeah, I mean, you can be remarkable, but Listen, yeah, compared to what? Compared to overcoming 22 years of prison, or I, I have another guest in the book named Andrea Lyotto Pete. And 10 years ago, she was diagnosed with ALS. ALS usually kills you in three to five years. When she got ALS, she decided to raise awareness for ALS and raise money. So she did it by completing marathons in all 50 states, right? So you think about remarkable people. They have ALS and they're completing marathons. They have 22 years of prison and they're now a hot artist. That's remarkable. You um, <clears throat> mentioned the title of your book and it, and it, it, it appears that you, you were inspired to, to connect the title of your book to Apple's iconic Think Different campaign. What, did, what inspired that? Well, Trust me when I tell you that one of the hardest parts of a book is the title. Mm -hmm. And what's even harder than the title is the subtitle. <laughs> Good thing I got a mute button. Anyway, <laughs> so um, we're searching for titles like how to be remarkable remarkable you. I mean, every kind of permutation, you throw that into chat GPT, you describe the book, you ask it to come up with 10 titles and all that. Now think different for those of you who are not around in 1997. Think different is the ad campaign. This was an Apple was on the ropes and they came up with this ad campaign called Think Different, which featured Picasso, Amelia Earhart, Richard Branson, uh, Albert Einstein, and, and people like that, Martin Luther King. And the pitch was that, you know what, if you want to be innovative, you want to be cool, you want to make a difference, you want to dent the universe, you have to think different. You can't think like everybody else. And so it was a beautiful campaign. And between that campaign and the IMAX, the, the IMAX that today's IMAX is just like just a monitor and it's flat. But back then, an iMac was teardrop shaped. It looked like, you know, kind of a big pregnant watermelon. And it came in colors like cherry and tangerine and blueberry and all that. It was, it was really beautiful in its time. And so that ad campaign focused on people thinking different because you had to think different to use a Macintosh when the whole world's telling you that Apple's going to die. And so... I was thinking, you know, that that was really helpful for Apple. And well, it now in the in the current state of the world, it's not enough to think different. You need to think remarkable. So I'm trying to up the game and I'm trying to up the challenge to not just think different, but think remarkable. And I didn't come up with the name. It was a surfing buddy of mine who said, you know what? What you call it? Think remarkable as a like based on think different. And I said, yes, that's absolutely what we should do. It's funny when when somebody comes up with the right title, you know, you kind of know it instantly. Uh, I heard. Wait, what happened during the uh, the rollout meeting <clears throat> with Steve Jobs <laughs> when when you with, with the Think Different campaign? Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I was afraid you're going to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I'm in this room, I'm at Apple, I'm a chief evangelist, and Steve Jobs is just making his re-entry into Apple. <clears throat> so Lee Clow, the advertising expert and really legend, he comes in and he shows the, the rough cuts of the Think Different television commercials. 
And this is a room with 10, 15 people in it, all the marketing people. And we just love the ad because it just captures the spirit of rebel and innovator and different thinker. And at the end of this meeting, Lee Klaus says to Steve Jobs, I have two copies of the videotape. I'll give one to you and one to Guy. And Steve Jobs, as only Steve Jobs could do, he says, don't give one to Guy. And now this is one of those moments, you know, that you don't want to look back and say, why did I just cower in fear? Why did I just, you know, stick my tail between my legs and go off in a corner? This is a man or mouse moment. So Steve Jobs says, you know, don't give one to guy. So I stay. What's the matter, Steve? Don't you trust me? And Steve Jobs, as only Steve Jobs could, he says, yes, guy, I don't trust you. So now, now this is the breaking point, right? This is, you're at the edge of the cliff. You're either going up or down. And so I, I say to him, that's okay, Steve, because I don't trust you either, Steve. Now, maybe in hindsight, that witty remark cost me a few million in stock options, but I'm <laughs> telling you, it was worth it. It was worth it just to tell this story. <laughs> How did it, what happened next? Well, I eventually, shortly thereafter, I, I left Apple and I, you know, started starting companies. And then, but I tell you something, a few years later, Steve asked me to return to Apple to run Apple University. This is the training program for new employees. And I declined. So I'm the, I'm the dipshit left Apple twice and turned down Steve once. And, you know, if I were a bit more remarkable, I would have stayed at Apple. But then again, if I had stayed at Apple, I would have made a boatload of money, but I would also probably be insufferable. So, you know, <laughs> and then I would not have had a lot of these great experiences. And for one thing, you can't exactly be a podcaster and work for Apple because Apple so tightly controls whatever you say. Well, talk about uh, great experiences. I know somebody influenced you to start playing hockey in your 40s and surf in your 60s. Can you tell me more about that? Well, um, both stories are true. I learned I started playing hockey at the age of 44 and I started surfing at the age of 60. And for those of you familiar with either of those two sports, that's 42 or 40 years too late for hockey. And that's 56 years too late for surfing. Now, the, the lesson behind this, though, is the book is divided into three sections, growth, grit, and grace. And this is about growth. So the growth mindset believes that you don't think... Your ability is fixed, that you can learn new skills, learn new subjects, that you can expand and grow. The fixed mindset says you are what you are. You cannot be any more. And if you are born naturally talented, you cannot be any less. You cannot deteriorate. So I read the book of Carol Dweck, Mindset. And it was eye-opening. It says, basically, you know what? You're either a growth mindset person or a fixed mindset person. And this is like two pieces of real evidence of a growth mindset. Because let's just say that most people don't take up hockey at 44, especially if they never skated in their life. Because I came from Honolulu. And let's just say there's not a lot of pond hockey in Honolulu, right? I mean, the, the closest thing to ice hockey in Honolulu is probably shaved ice. <laughs> and then at age 60, my, my daughter decides to really take up surfing. And I say, well, what the hell? You know, so I took up surfing too. And now surfing is an absolute obsession. So I have you and then I have one more interview and then I'm going surfing. That's my day today. <laughs> Um, that sounds like a great day, guy. It is well, a great day. Uh, uh, the book is called Think Remarkable, Nine Paths to Transform Your Life and Make a Difference. Uh, guy, I really appreciate the uh, the joy 
that's evident that you bring uh, to each of your conversations as well as uh, your storytelling ability to go through your career and to highlight some of these really cool things you've learned that can help all of us. So I really appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for being here. Can, can I ask you a question? Of course. Is the background behind you? That's real, right? That's it not, is real. Yeah. And so what's your lighting? How many lights do you have on your face? I have a big one right here. You can probably yeah. tell shining down. I have a side one right there. I have one right back there that's shooting back here. I have that one you can see that's more for show, but I think it's cool there. And then I have two bigger ones up there along with windows that are shining down here. So uh, I actually don't uh, cannot take credit for any of this. I asked the guys who video uh, and film my speeches to come to my studio and to, I just said, Hey, what should I buy? And then will you come to my studio and set it up? And so the camera that I have is this DSLR. That's really nice. All of the lights is all from the video guys. And then we got it set up because I thought, Hey, this is my full-time thing. I want to, it needs to be professionally done. And so I got help from people who do this for their, for their job. And, uh, it's, I think it's, it's elevated the the level of the podcast ever since we got this professional yeah. studio. So you're saying you have about six lights? Uh, yes. Holy cow. Wow. Yeah. And what kind I don't of look as good as you, you, so I got to try my best with everything I can find <laughs> here, you know? <laughs> I mean, what kind of DSLR are you using? It's a Sony. I can send you the exact brand, but it's a Sony. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice one. And Is that what you have? Like oh. a... Like a what, like, we have a special lens on it as well. I don't necessarily know the particulars other than I got exactly what they told me to get. And I said, I, I don't want to, the cost is not a factor. I want the best yeah. looking studio in the world. And so you tell me what it is. And those guys were like, it was like Christmas for them. So like, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and, and they got all the stuff and here we are now that it's been a few years and it's, it's, I, I love it. It's, it's one of my favorite places to be. I get to hang out. This is where yeah. I write. This is where it, I think. It's where your, I record podcasts. video is really beautiful. So I Thank have, you. I, I just learned of something that maybe you probably all know you have a better system, but I just bought something from, um, I think it's Elgato and it's a, it's a uh, transcription. I mean, it's a teleprompter. Teleprompter? Yeah. yeah. Do you use a teleprompter? I don't, I don't, but I mean, if I was doing straight to camera reads, that's when I would need one for no. sure. I've, I've used teleprompters, but not for my podcast. But you know what? I mean, I, I am the same way. I never yeah. put the text on the teleprompter. I right. just use it. So how are you so good at staring at the camera as opposed to looking oh. at my face, which is probably much lower? It's funny that you notice that, but it is a lot of practice. I do it yeah, all day, yeah. every day. It is very tiring, though, because I want to look at you. I'm I know, I know. Now, but I'm looking okay, at the so, camera. Yes, so, it's hard. But so, you notice I peak sometimes. But for the most part, for your benefit and for the benefit of the people watching you have to look into the camera and it's not as natural although it is natural for me now because i've done it for years literally every, and i do it with clients too so clients uh, virtual speeches you got to look into the camera and so i'm just i'm just used to it by now but yeah. uh until we find a better way this is kind of the way we got to well, do it i'm telling you i think i have maybe i can suggest a better way so okay. just look up elgato prompt okay and one of the big pain in the ass of a teleprompter is that it's this thing that you put over your camera, but yeah. then there's a tray in front and then you have to figure out how to get an iPad or something to display. That's what's reflected that goes into your eyes. Yeah. And to, to get that iPad to act as a second screen, there's always some kind of utility. And then every time you boot your computer, it's like, do you want to upgrade it now or it doesn't <laughs> find the system or you know whatever it's all like it's a headache well the elgato prompt for like 300 bucks it comes with a little monitor so you don't have to futz with an ipad the monitor is part of the system and it's flawless so you are just, you using run right now i'm using so I, I didn't move the window. So the right now, uh, right now, I think I'm looking in your eyes. Okay. Now I'm moving. If I move the the window up to the teleprompter, now I'm looking at the teleprompter and I now I know I'm looking at your eyes. Huh. So it's, it's a 
big. It makes it a lot easier. So I'm going to get one. Thank you. And you took it right up to, up, up to your DSLR. Um, yeah, it, it, uh, your camera. There, there's this, it comes with a bunch of little lens, uh, brackets. So depending okay. on the size lens, you use the right bracket and then it hooks onto the, the camera. I mean, it's, awesome. it's really well done. Trust me. Well, you look, you look you're amazing. People, you're yeah. you're going to teach your AV people something. They're going to say, my God, you know, wow. You got this before we did. Uh, yeah, I'm going to buy it right when we get off the, get off here, man, and then I'll figure out how to work it later. But yeah, anything to make this thing better. I'm. Oh, uh, there's no point. It, th- great already. Well, okay. it, this is awesome. I didn't know I was going to get this little lesson at the end, but I, 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 from a fellow podcasters, it is cool to talk through these things. That's usually where you learn this stuff. You look amazing, by the way. Uh, so you get good living and your setup is beautiful too. So <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm going to leave all this in. I think it's fun, but I really appreciate it, guy. Enjoy your next interview Thank and you. then en- enjoy enjoy the, those the, the, those times uh, on the waves out, out in the ocean, man. That's the best. Oh, we will. Awesome. Bye-bye. Thank you.